Why twice? I no idea. Worked a moment ago, but here we are. We've made it. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Here we are once again. Speak for a moment, uh, Rupert, because yes. of course I've left another yeah. window open, and I, that's why I can hear myself well twice. I well beg, done. Uh, I beg your uh, pardon, everybody. I don't know what it's like for uh, all you folks all over the place down here where I am. It's absolutely roasting. And I would have a fan on in here, except that it just makes too much noise for the microphone. And so I'm just going to sit and uh, and sweat quietly oh. for your... Uh... <laughs> yeah, Are you venturing very, very into warm. the realm of too much information, <laughs> really? <laughs> Nobody really wanted hey to know that. Hey-ho. But we're happy. Uh, we're, yeah, uh, we're very good indeed. Thanks very much mm. indeed, folks. Thanks for being here as uh, ever. And uh, very jolly to see you all lined up in in the chat. Special welcome to uh, Lazzie McLandrover or Matt and your family who stayed up specially to watch Prehistory <laughs> Guys Q and A. Well done. <laughs> well done. Special kudos. <laughs> Yes, we do appreciate it. <laughs> Certainly do. Well, we've yes, got let's a whole... just hope we don't let you down. <laughs> no, we'll do our best. Uh, I, I see everybody, a lot of familiar faces. And if you're with us for <laughs> Sibylla, the f- Sibylla says glowing gently is what it's called. Thank you, Sibylla. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're with us for the first time and don't know who we are and uh, what we're doing, uh, first of all, uh, v- Big welcome to you. Uh, we're the Prehistory Guys, and we do our best to provide an interface between you lovely folk and uh, proper prehistoric archaeology that uh, goes on behind the scenes. And, um, you know, we try and uh, interpret and reveal and uh, comment as much as we can, as sensibly as we can, uh, on the stuff that uh, goes on in uh, prehistoric archaeology. That about sums us up, doesn't it? Uh, and we make films. We've been doing podcasts. We do quick stuff on here, and we do stuff like this. And, of course, we are supported by quite a lot of the people that you can see in the, the chat here who are uh, largely our uh, Patreon followers, who support us on, on Patreon. So if that's something you'd uh, like to do as you... <laughs> If you feel that we're making a contribution <laughs> to, uh, uh, yeah, uh, your knowledge mm. and uh, understanding, then uh, feel free to yes. uh, join us over on on Patreon. Um, yes. Rupert, yeah, well what else? I'd can say, I say eloquently put. But, oh uh, well, I don't know about that. I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? I don't, it's just busy, busy, isn't it? Um, we we get. Um, I, I mean, largely thanks to you, and it's certainly not a complaint. Uh, we get busier by the day, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean that's showing no signs of slowing down. So uh, yeah, we've got an yeah. awful lot. Uh, but I tell you what, I moment. tell you what, Rupert. I mean, in the world of you know telling people what we're about, it's all beginning to make, yes. from my point of view anyway. I don't know about you, a lot more sense in what we're doing. We're doing short. We're form, more streamlined, aren't we? Yeah, we're a bit more streamlined. Doing short form shows, and shortly. Um, the uh, prehistory show will be coming back, uh, a form of mm. an hour or more of a magazine program when we do lots of mm. individual bits. But sometimes it could be a long form interview. It mm. could be whatever we choose, really. But for the most part, it'll, it'll be a sort of uh, <laughs> it could. A, a, yeah. a magazine it could. Uh, program with lots of different, yeah. with a with a variety yeah. of uh, well topics. You, you know, a lot of you will will know. Um, that we started the prehistory show as a magazine show, I don't know, a year ago, something like that. Yeah. And uh, and we eased off it because... Oh, and we've lost Rupert by the sound of it, at least I have. Uh, we eased off it because uh, we were doing too much uh, and, and we found the work flu- flow too much, but I think now we've found a, a way of doing it and... Uh, and providing uh, really good value. The other thing is, as we wait for uh, Rupert to re-establish himself, uh, I think he's gone completely. I will see what I can do to get him back. Uh, But as uh, we're talking to uh, Patreon folk, um, most of all here, interest, oh no, would you believe it? Rupert has a power cut. (laughs) I don't know how permanent it's going to be. 
so that's a bit of a disaster, isn't it? I'm here all on my own. What am I going to do? I was going to say that, um, um, uh, that latterly, there have been so many um, uh, uh, extra things uh, on Patreon. Um, and one of them has been the Monday Megalith, which sadly has come to an end. It's uh, run its course, but we're replacing it very, very, very soon um, with uh, an item that we're calling um, Michael and Rupert's Prehistory Moot, in which uh, every week, I think it'll be towards the end of the week now, we're not tied to a Monday anymore because uh, we don't need to do the an on anim <laughs> animatopoeia anymore, um, we'll be presenting you with you know a very informal podcasty kind of thing in which we just choose a particular subject that's come up at the moment uh, and uh, have a chat about it. Um, well, just excuse me one moment. I'm getting a call from uh, Rupert on... Yeah, hold on a second. Let me see um, if I can bring you in, mm, if at all. Yeah. Uh, one second, folks. Any idea, you know, from history how long that uh, uh, um, power cut is going to last? Yeah. Yeah. So bear with me, folks. I'm afraid I'm not very good at patting my head and rubbing, rubbing tummy at the same time. Uh, well, that's what I'm trying to... Uh, it, it sounds, I think, to folk that I'm having a one-sided uh, conversation. What I'm going to do, though, if you just bear with me for uh, a couple of minutes, I'll I'll go quiet. But I I may be able to bring um, uh, the Rup the uh, Skype uh, Rupert Skype into the program I ha have here. So I'm going to shut up for a moment. Uh, bear with me. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay, good news, folks. Uh, uh, Rupert's power is back on. He being down in rural France, and uh, thanks for hanging around and uh, being patient uh, with us when we sort that out. It'll still be a few minutes of while um, his machine boots up, uh, etc. Um, yes, I was trying to lay out uh, what it is, uh, um, you know, how the output, our output is going to look. We'll have the short shows on YouTube, Prehistory Flashes, which you know about, the Prehistory Show, and other regular stuff will be the weekly podcast for, um, for Patreon. Um, and once in a while, we will share that onto, onto YouTube, so folk outside of Patreon, you know, know what. <laughs> can find out what they're missing. <laughs> um, aside from that, of course, we are ongoingly in, or launching ourselves into the pre-production realms of Standing with Stones 2. Now, we still haven't got a shape exactly on you know what that's going to look like, and the coming months will be largely about us uh, developing that. And, of course, 
Uh, most of you will be on the inside track of that and you'll be the first to hear about new developments, about the story we're going to tell and how we're going to tell it if you're on Patreon. So if you want to be able to follow that, join us on, uh, on Patreon, folks. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to that. And just to outline the plan of that, very soon uh, I'll be launching a uh, Buy Me A Coffee uh, campaign so that people can make one-off donations to that. Obviously, people in Patreon are already contributing to the development of that through their monthly subscription. And towards the back end of this year, we hope to be in a position to launch a proper Kickstarter campaign where we will raise the larger sort of capital amounts that uh, Rupert and I will need in order to fulfil the filming and production of Standing With Stones 2. We don't know what kind of a budget it will be yet because we don't have a script yet. And that, you know, the budget is always determined by script. Um, and, you know... It, it'll be a question of how much we're travelling abroad um, and uh, and all those kinds of things. How we're travelling, what we're staying in. I don't think we'll be staying in a camper van this time, un uh, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, I haven't been paying attention uh, to the chat, uh, folks. I've just been filling in time, making a noise. <laughs> Uh, Riss, I see you ask, uh, is there anything Patreons can do to help? Well, by and large, you already are. Uh, I mean, hugely, hugely. I mean, we wouldn't be where we are if it wasn't for you Patreon uh, lot already. So, um, goodness, I think if anything, what we'll probably be doing, you know, if you keep your ear to the ground, we may sort of uh, asking for bits of advice and, uh, and requests for uh, material uh, you know, like, um, have you got any ideas about where we could stay in certain places? Have you, do you know anybody in PR that would be willing to help us you know, uh, launch ourselves towards the uh, the Kickstarters campaign and, and uh, make sure that's a, as effective uh, uh, as possible? Um, no doubt many things will come up along along the line. So, you know, we'll, we'll ask you a lot to, um, you know, if you've got any ideas first. Um, yeah, sharing videos helps with uh, publicity too. Yeah, I've got yet to properly develop uh, uh, the campaign um, so that we can, um, uh, you know, so that that's got a shape that people can understand and and follow. Um, Phil says uh, they're watching football at the power station. More than likely. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, probably. <laughs> Probably France scored, <laughs> says Diana. Oh, nice one. Uh, any more questions there while we wait for um, for Rupert? Got a fascinating bunch of questions tonight, I have to say. And there's a kind of basic theme behind them. And it's about um, uh, perceptions and uh, and how, how we deal with uh, evidence and uh, how we... Uh, are willing to make up stories on the spot sometimes on the scantiest of, of, of evidence you know and, uh, and it's that's both exciting and it can be dangerous so we'll be talking about that um let me see da, 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 contents uh, but that's all that's um, been going on. Oh, last week we managed to nail down Tim Darvel again. So there'll be, in a couple of weeks' time, there'll be another interview with uh, Tim Darvel, uh, Professor Tim Darvel, coming up. Uh, interestingly, we, we didn't, we've avoided the subject before. In this one, we do ask a direct question about uh, whether the Stonehenge uh, tunnel is a, a good idea or not. Uh, I can still see Rupert on... Uh, no? Oh, he's gone off uh, Skype, so that's a good thing. Um, and it's a case in point, actually, of how we're able to use the material that we do. Um, because uh, as well as having a straightforward uh, interview with Tim, um, we also segment st things out so that we can apportion them, them into the magazine program as, uh, as time goes by. And here's a thing, you know, uh, if there are things you'd like, once you see the format of the prehistory show again, um, uh, our ears are open for 
anything you'd like us to include in the show, um, you know, or people would like to, to feature. People are a very important part of what we do. And when we started off, we didn't know many people, but we seem to have developed quite a, a coterie of uh, very interesting um, archaeologists and uh, other interested folk along the way. Um, so you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really nice to have the the support of uh, of professional people in what we're doing. Uh, let me just see if there's anything else. I'm I never knew I had it in me to talk non-stop nonsense. Okay, a what is a va Kronos Kiron? Is that a a magazine? Is that a a whole conversation going on there? David Potter, what a flipping star you are, mate. Thank you so much. And also, I have to say, David, thank you for your anniversary wishes on Facebook. I only just picked them up the other day. Uh, it was my wedding anniversary not so long ago. And David sent a little note. Bless him. Thank you. Um, still waiting on... Uh, still waiting on, on Rupert. He's staring at me in... Oh, no, wait a minute. Oh, he is, he is coming, right. I can see his little face on uh, on Skype there. <laughs> uh, Neil, Neil Desperandum, folks. Uh, daughter just asked a good one. How about an interview with Tim Taylor of Time T? Well, you know, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Here he comes. Uh, Hello. Have you been, have watching, you been watching me, watching wittering me, wittering for... I, do you know what? I, I take my hat off to you. Uh, I, yeah, I've been watching you the whole time on my phone. And um, uh, well done. Well done. That was, uh, was almost I, I, I was not. I was not made for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, I can only apologise. Honestly, it's ridiculous, isn't it? So anybody watching this on catch-up, oh, my God, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. But, I can't, uh, no, I can't we, cut I don't it know out because we'll lose... Just, uh, no, I can't exactly. cut it out because no, we we'll uh, lose all the chat if, it, if I. Alter but it's it. yeah. just one rumble of thunder in the mountains and suddenly pop. That was it. Um, oh, uh, somebody suggested uh, they were watching the match on television. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a terrible confession to a lot of you people. I hate oh, no. football. I really, uh -huh. really can't say it. It was probably the most oh, boring game on the planet. Oh, um, the numbers are going uh, down, Rupert. They, they're gone. <laughs> they're going. Why do I want to watch 22 millionaires run around a field? Why? It just. <laughs> we could. That's a, it's a talking point. Uh, <laughs> we could do that. Um, we could. Anyway, I'm, I'm very sorry, folks. There was nought I could do. Uh, <laughs> I was getting Matt's messages from daughter just before I, just before you came back. I was saying Matt's yes. uh, daughter has asked a good question. How about an interview with Tim Taylor of Time Team? Put That's quite that nice. In, uh, actually, put that right yeah. that down this instant. <laughs> um, uh, because I'm it, that's yeah that's if he'd be prepared to talk to us, of course. Um, yeah, I think it's a false thing that we we got this thing. Oh, we're in competition with Time Team. No, we're not. We you know we we do a different thing. Uh, we do a we, profoundly different thing. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, but um, uh, yes, you never know with these busy folks. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'll, you know, I'll contact him. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Lynn. Bless you for your kind words. Shall we try and ask, answer some questions? It's about time, I, th I think. I think we probably should. Right? I think we probably I'm should. I'm going to yes, pass I, everything I to you now. I'm, I'm spent, <laughs> my dear. Spent. <laughs> yeah, well done. Well done. <laughs> Let's go to a question. And it's yes. from, from uh, Jay Grant. Was the development of agriculture from a single origin which uh, spread or was it developed in various parts of the world and amalgamated? Either way, what are the earliest examples in England and how can we tell? Um, wow. It, it, it's a, it's a, a glorious great, question. And yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we could be here for hours. Um, and we say that a lot. Well, <laughs> that's true, we do. That's true, we do. Um, I, do you know what? I don't even think it's right to say 
amalgamated. You know, the thing is that uh, agriculture arose independently uh, in loads of places around the world uh, about 12,000 years ago. Uh, there's evidence for it in uh, in China. When you say China, it's big enough. North China, South China, India, yeah. uh, Europe. You know, it, there's evidence for China, uh, for uh, farming uh, or farming agriculture uh, starting uh, all over the world at around the same uh, sort of time. Um Earliest examples in uh, in Britain. Well, again, you see, it's 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 very difficult to um, to pin down. You know, if you're talking about um, crops, actually deciding that you're not going out to get grains from wild grasses, because uh, you know, there's a, a backtracking slightly. I find it quite fascinating that one of the oldest examples or of um, of bread is Natufian. So this is from uh, uh, this is from the Fertile Crescent uh, in the Middle East, fourteen thousand years ago. Uh, there's toast. They found some fourteen thousand year old toast. Now that would have been made from the seeds or the grains of wild grasses. This wasn't farmed grasses. Um, so, uh, so you know, agriculture. You know that if it's that you're actually deciding that you want to grow this grain specifically, rather than harvesting these grains because you know that you can go out in the wild, uh, you know, and gather these. It, it's still a knowledge of um, of the plants that you want to use for specific purposes. Uh, so, fourteen thousand years ago, you got toast, which means they probably had bread for a little while before before that or maybe they didn't mm. it's the earliest example of burnt bread um but in britain uh you know yeah. we've got um uh, we've got uh wheat in britain in fact only two years ago they actually found uh, in the solent so off the south coast of britain between britain and the isle of Wight, uh they uh, they found uh wheat that was being imported from the continent. Now that's eight thousand years ago. Uh, so, well, the significance you know, of that uh, is that it suggests that Mesolithic people were, you know, trading, or there was some yeah. kind of exchange going across. Was the mm. land link still available there, or did we still have uh, eight thousand uh, yeah. eight thousand years ago? It, it was more or less Not when so it much. went. Yeah. So, uh, so the point is, you still had the south of Britain. It was still more river delta than sea, uh, yeah. so a, a lot more easy to cross than uh, than it is now. It, you but know, that, that is boats, it would the shape more boats. Yeah, but 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 that is the shockingly early answer to the question. That is the earliest example of cultivated. Mm. Uh, what is it? The icon variety or something i can't remember Do you know what? i'm ashamed to say i don't remember the variety um, yeah it begins but it might be. be yeah yeah uh, but what is occurring it to backtrack a little bit because as you rightly said agriculture uh, kicked off in various places and at different times you know there's a sort of chrono chronology but not one influencing the other isn't isn't a kind of knock on effect uh, agriculture mm. arose independently at, at different times in africa uh, in suma uh, in egypt uh, and of course in, mm. in China, as, as you said, and a few uh, other places. But the agriculture that we talk about, because we're talking about the um, uh, the the, the agri type of agriculture that farmers brought into uh, Britain for, from the continent, that is most likely the origins of that agricultural culture is the Sumerian because that first established itself in the Fertile Crescent, uh, moved to uh, Turkey, uh, mo moved to Anatolia, mm -hmm. and then spread throughout the Mediterranean. And mm. then things diverged. One lot went up the Danube, and the other lot went across the Mediterranean. And mm -hmm. it's the lot that ended up in uh, <clears throat> Iberia, through that route, the lower route, that actually came up the Atlantic seaboard and 
you know, uh, and uh, started building stuff in Brittany and then came over, over to Britain. So ours is not the Danube route. Ours is the, um, yeah, the, the, the Mediterranean. Lot. Genetically the, speaking, yeah. it's, yeah. <laughs> Our lot came I suppose from you, the, Mediterranean. The, the question really is, uh, can we say, uh, who asked the question, Jay? Jay Grant. Where is Jay? Where is Jay? I hear Jay. I can't see. Um, because uh, because that's uh, that that might have a, um, a a bearing on the answer to the question. You know that uh, yeah. uh, that if uh, if if Jade is in Britain, then uh, uh, then you know that there, there's a good answer there. Anywhere else in the world, and you can say, well, you know, you've you've got these different pockets of things you know, developing independently. Um, yeah. And it, it's funny how it, it seems to happen so much uh, in human history that things do happen. It's it's like we we reach a um, you know a watershed moment where suddenly something changes for the entire uh, population globally. You know that it just. It's it's quite strange how that can happen sometimes. Yeah, Helen makes a good point. Agriculture includes hus husbandry. Yeah, and I think we're talk we're talking mm. mainly about agrarian culture here. Though mm. there is an interesting thing that once we get into the Neolithic, we sort of regress to pastoralism. Uh, yes. up, up until um, the Bronze Age, where there's a sort of revolution back to agrarian uh, stuff again. But that's another. That's the answer mm. to a different question. I should not get ahead of myself. Uh, the only other but, thing you I say, would say I mean, about the earliest evidence <laughs> of uh, agriculture is uh, middens in Scotland, particularly uh, uh, trawling through through those. Um, which again, there's a crossover between the Mesolithic and uh, and Scotland. Mm -hmm. But I think, I, without, I think we've about, about done that. We've about sorry, Rupert. We've about to uh, launch upon something. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> It's fine. No, I I think you know because the thing is that there that there isn't a, a straight and simple answer to this. You know, you you could really be picking, uh, you know, picking things globally. Uh, I mean, it's a fascinating subject, and there is much to be read about it. The research oh. that's been done yeah. on it is uh, is monumental. You know, you could read the rest of your life away. Yeah. Most of the clarity yeah. about it is actually coming through human genetics rather than evidence from direct evidence of. Oh, do you know when yeah. when you start getting into uh, the <laughs> yeah. isotopic stuff, it's just it's riveting. It's that absolutely well. riveting. Yeah. And uh, um, yes, yeah. I mean, again, you know, we we could do another hour long program just about yeah. that. But um, well, I hope broadly mm. speaking, that's uh, given a you know a. A broad outline of the limits and of answer, our, yeah. uh, uh, knowledge, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, painted mm. a little picture. Um, so we move on to mm. uh, the next question. And thanks for that, Jay. That was a great sort of kick off. Thank you, Jay. Talking <laughs> point. Jojo Hughes, have you seen uh, more evidence for prehistoric communities? Now, I'll have to go back to the original question because there's a quite a. Uh, a lot about uh, prehistoric communities in the UK and Ireland consciously using structures as multi-layered records to be read or added to by future generations. This is about uh, Catherine Freeman's 2016 paper on mountain barrows, where she suggests uh, the layering over time of different coloured clays, stones and soils over the barrows as a kind of mnemonic m design uh, and some kind of memory incorporated into the layering of uh, of that stuff of the, of the uh, the soils and the muds and things like that. Um, and I, I think Jojo is asking: Is there many, any more evidence for that kind of thing? And I would have to say, of there isn't really evidence. For for that, that is a conjecture. Oh, don't tell me. <laughs> Are you coming back, Rupert? Or has the uh, power gone for good? He is uh, typing on Skype. Um, I, I don't think, you, because the, there isn't, there can't be evidence for people using layers of soil as memory. That's a conjecture to explain the layers. 
So I have to be honest and say that I have not read Catherine Freeman and therefore not in a position to judge whether she makes a compelling case for it or not. But the answer to the question is really, is there any more evidence for it? No, there can't be any more evidence for it. Well, that would be silly to say there can't be, but you really got to think very hard to imagine what evidence would provide support for that. What would you look for? And that, that's, you know, one of the huge problems in archaeology. It's all very well having a conjecture about what they were up to, etc. But how do you test the hypothesis? How do you be scientific about it, in other words? Uh, and, and how do you construct uh, a, fr a framework uh, that you can look into the past, through which you can look into the archaeology that would support, or not, because that's the important thing about science, is you know, disproving it, um, uh, you know, something. Uh, you falsify it. You look for evidence that falsifies your hypothesis and then you can move, if it does, you can move on. That's how it goes. Now, I'm going to switch back to, hold on a moment, folks. Uh, that's all I've got on that without uh, the support of my friend who has disappeared again. And if he's gone for reasons of a power cut, then uh, I'm afraid then he... Um, uh, he may be some time coming back. Um, Skype says Rupert is typing. We will wait with bated breath <laughs> for the next instalment. Um, that's all I've got for you on my own, Jojo. I, I'm sure Rupert would have had something to say. And uh, if he has, we'll come, uh, come back to that. Uh, I will move on to um, Peter's question. Peter Chesper. Hold on a second. Let me get find my mouse. Um, Peter asks, uh, ever looked at a six-foot-high granite gatepost on Dartmoor and thought, I wonder if the farmer, uh, uh, I wonder if the farmer reused someone else's stone. Um, well, uh, the answer to that, Peter, is. Have you, se have you seen Standing With Stones? I think uh, actually uh, Rupert made that very point uh, when we were somewhere near Menantol uh, in Cornwall. Um, uh, but, you know, the same thing pertains on Dartmoor as well. It's kind of one of the most... I, I think people realise this, that stones on a farmer's land are just in the way. Um... And unless monuments are protected, and they didn't start to be protected until the late 19th century, I think one of the first um, protected monuments in the whole of the UK was the um, uh, Nine Ladies of Stanton Moor. Actually, I was up there last, uh, last week. Gosh, very fine it was in the sunshine too. But I think that was the, if not the first protected monument. Uh, which makes it against the law to shift those stones about. But before that, uh, you only have to look at places like uh, Avebury or any other place. And I'm sure um, aerial photography and LIDAR <coughs> are going to re reveal huge numbers of places where originally there was stone and that has been removed uh, over, over the years by uh, simply by the intensity of uh, farming. Uh, and uh, farmers needs to um, ex what's the word uh, to uh, exploit uh, their land as they are obliged to do as, as best they they can we have lost in other words far more um, stone monuments uh, to farming than I think uh, I think we knew the numbers it would be frightening not only that of course the, the stones that we do see in the landscape mostly, if not entirely, owe their existence to good people who have restored them. 
most most stones have been if they're not completely missing they've been cast down fallen down uh, over the years and it was uh, only with the rise of anti uh, antiquarianism and interest by uh, gentlemen of, of leisure again towards 19th century and towards the end of the 19th century uh, who set about restoring these places that we can see so many other places in the landscape we do now um, He's on his way back, folks. <laughs> He's on his way back. Um, so am I answering the question? Uh, uh, well, the answer is yes, we did look at uh, stuff in the landscape and think, well, uh, in fact, almost everywhere I go where there's, no, there's been Neolithic activity, when there's been uh, stone building going on uh, in, in the Neolithic, you... Uh, Derbyshire, Shropshire, that was a place, where's um, the place in Shrop Druid Circle? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, no, Mitchell's Fold, Mitchell's Fold, very nearby there. Uh, what, it's known that one circle just down the hill from Mitchell's Fold com completely disappeared into the landscape, into the farmer's walls, etc. Uh, there's just an empty field where a stone circle used to be. So, thank you, Peter, for that. Let me find out if I can uh, uh, get myself organised and move on to uh, the next question, which is from Sibylla. Hi there. Who, what are you calling yourself today? Neil Carborundum. <laughs> Sibylla asks, I've long wait, wanted to question the idea that Stonehenge was the capital of prehistoric Britain, or that Orkney was, for that matter. Surely a capital is needed when there's a centrally governed state and not before. What do you think? Um, well, very much, uh, I think, in accord with you know your feelings on that, uh, um, Sibylla. Um, it's such a... It's so jumping the gun to apply wor such words as capital. I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent myself, I bought into it when uh, Neil Oliver and uh, that uh, team brought us, brought us um, Britain's Neolithic Capital, or whatever the name of the programme was, uh, based on the research, well, based on the um, uh, excavations that have been going on at the Ness of Brogga and the revelations about the extraordinary uh, site that's been found there. But you have to remember that Orkney is completely special in that it has its stone. And so the dwelling places and any places of importance that anywhere else have long since disappeared into the ground and rotted away are still there. Now, it's wrong to, in my mind anyway, to compare, to balance those two establish uh, Wiltshire or Stonehenge as some kind of a, a capital against Orkney as some kind of a capital because you're comparing uh, apples and uh, oranges. Um, what's built in stone on Orkney it represents something completely different to what we find built in stone at Stonehenge and, and thereabouts. Yes, we know there are loads of huts and, uh, and dwelling places that have long since disappeared and uh, modern techniques and uh, the uh, oh I'm getting a call in from Mr. Soskin just bear with me one second um, I don't know if you'll be able to hear this I suspect not so you'll have to bear with me in a one-sided conversation for just a moment what have you got to say Rupert Yeah, okay. What can you say? Hold on a second, let me uh, get me there. Oh, right, okay. Okay. Um, let me just see. Oh, it's, not, it's all going horribly wrong. Who would have thought?
Yeah, 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 yeah. So sorry, I'm 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 listening to to Rupert and I'm trying to uh, have your attention at the same time, which is unfair. It looks like uh, Rupert's power is staying out at the moment. So at at the moment, um, unfortunately, we used to be able to bring Skype calls into Ecam Live, which is the uh, software that I'm using to broadcast to you now. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be available anymore. Uh, it, Rupert needs to be... Uh, you can't follow... The, I'm just... Sorry, I'm just talking to Rupert. You can't follow... Just follow that link on uh, on your phone. It, there is no... Uh, oh, uh, okay. Okay, good. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to scan the... Uh, the comments here a moment um, and see if anybody's got any bright ideas. Um, I was just answering the question uh, about Neolithic capitals. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'll, uh, shall I carry on? Uh, the trouble is if you're the trouble is if you're there. <laughs> uh, I, I I'm very distracted from paying attention to. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was paying attention to these. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, Rupert's just told me to carry on as best I can. Uh, until his power things g get sorted out. He's been sending me messages, but I haven't been seeing them since because I've been uh, trying to pay a, a, a attention here. Um, so, yeah, where was I? Um, get Rupert in the chat. <laughs> okay, I'll just uh, message in that. In that. Uh, good idea. Thank you, Sue. Yes, he, sh he should be able to comment uh, comment on, on his on his phone. Anyway, where was I with the uh, yeah Neolithic ca capitals? And I am I coming round? Am I answering your question uh, or you know giving? I think I don't know, Rupert and I talked about it a bit before, and I think by and large that was our. Uh, take on it. Uh, this is very much a thing between <clears throat> apples and or oranges. And the idea of, you know, what constitutes uh, a, uh, a, um, a community. Now we're thinking about larger than a community, aren't we? What constitutes a, a wider community so that you could legitimately use the word capital? I think, to be fair, Rupert, we used it in Standing with Stones um, one when talking about wealth and uh, all the flint that's available in the Wiltshire landscape and how that would have created wealth. And I think even Rupert may have said, you know, uh, that, that uh, Wiltshire may have been capital of the... But we use it in a very sort of loose term. I mean, obviously there were power centres, but whether... Uh, a capital, you know, whether Durrington Walls was the capital. The thing is, <laughs> what we forget is that there are places that have been built over. We just look at the open landscape and do archaeology when we can in the l open landscape, and there may well have, well have been prehistoric capitals that are, we'll never f discover because they're under towns like Salisbury, you know, not too far away or... Uh, you know, Durrington itself, or uh, where else? Um, uh, Boscombe Down, or <laughs> uh, you, you see what I mean? Though we've we've just got what we've got um, because we've it's been found in open landscape. What about the stuff that's hidden? So calling somewhere the capital uh, very dangerous because we just don't have enough evidence there to uh, to really um, uh, be confident about that. I hope I haven't uh, got...
gone off completely on one there. Let me get, move on to another question. Hope that does that. Uh, I know you're there, Sibylla. Uh, how was that? Uh, did I do all right? <laughs> K locks. I don't know who K locks is, or if you are here. Uh, if you are, thank you very much for the the question. Oh, um, Kay uh, asks, Hey guys, just wondered if Fiance have visited uh, Bermore Stone Circles in Cookston, Northern Ireland. Uh, so, uh, is there any links so I could check it out? Interested in your thoughts on this site. We've, um, Rupert and I have only been the once to Bermore, and it's a lovely, uh, it's a fantastic site, a complex site, and one that. Uh, be, be, if we could choose, and I think there's another question coming up about where, if we could visit a place in Northern Ireland, we would go to. And I think uh, um, Birmore is. is and if I, uh, correct me if I'm uh, pronouncing that wrong. Birmore. Um, I think Birmore's got a lot to uh, a lot to tell us. Um, it, it is a fascinating site to visit, you know, because you find yourself standing amongst uh, complexity. Um, ditched and banked circles, maybe... Oh, somebody's showing off the uh, exhaust power outside. Um, with, with kists and lumps and bumps. I'm sorry, I'm being very... Uh, um, not being exactly precise about my description of it. But having been there before, it, it has one of those enigmatic qualities, which you're there at the right time of day, and we, Rupert and I, were there when we were there. We were in, not by design, I have to say, we were late, <laughs> at the very end of the day, and the, and the sun was just setting and the moon was just uh, appearing in the sky. And it's very easy in your mind to associate it you know with the sky and and with the more mystical elements but looking at it on the ground i'm not so sure and i wonder if it's a multi-phase thing where earlier it was one purpose and then later on people came along and said we don't know what this is for it's obviously sacred and started burying people there i don't know um it it it, it, it it has also got the feel of once upon a time maybe having been a farm. And also, I suspect this is completely my conjecture. Don't look, go looking anywhere else for this and uh, feel free to blow me out of the water. But uh, aerial views that I've looked at have features running off into unexcavated areas in the adjacent fields which are overgrown which look that they probably extend a long way and look to me like the terminations of uh, curses or, or curses. Saying it right now, did you know that the plural of curses was curses? Like sheep. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, I think... And I think there are plans to uh, do a bit more uh, excavation at Birkmore and uh, hopefully they'll be able to see those features that run off into the, uh, into the adjacent fields uh, reveal something um, uh, interesting. Um, but, uh, yeah, absolutely delightful. So, and I'm sure, like I say, I think it's got a, a great deal to, uh, uh, to give us in the, in the future. Oh, and that you see the prehistory guys. That's Rupert. Uh, he's just rebooting now. Yay! Oh, oh what a hero! <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me find out now um, what the next question will be. Uh, I hope that was a fairly decent answer, K. Locks. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll be getting back to. Um, Northern Ireland during the making of Standing With Stones 2. Don't know yet, but let's keep, keep our fingers crossed. And if so, that we get to be more. 48 Walsh 
says, I hope you can read this, folks, but I, I know the writing is a bit small, and if you're watching this on a phone, it's probably a bit small. I'll read it to you. The idea of knowledge being accumulated power is an interesting one, uh, but is it not more likely that Orkney and other centres were ritual or religious centres? What is the consensus in anthropology and archaeology as to why religion and ritual changed after to the Mesolithic to Neolithic trans uh, uh, after the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition? Are functionalist types of interpretation the most common explanation for these uh, changes? The idea of knowledge being accumulated power is an interesting one, but it's not more likely that Orkney and other centres were ritual or religious centres. The trouble is, it's very difficult to uh, triangulate uh, our ideas about whether a place m uh, may be um, uh, for religious purposes or whether they be for just purely cultural purposes, centres of learning, uh, for example. It was conjectured, for example, that, uh, and that's how I think it's probably got its name, that the sanctuary down the bottom of um, West Cannon Avenue um, uh, near Avebury got its name, the sanctuary, because it was conjectured that this was a place of learning for the scholars of uh, Stonehenge and the en environs. But... That says more about us and the people making the interpretation than it does about the actual site. Because, like I was saying earlier, um, <laughs> how can you have evidence of these things occurring? What what would you look for? Evidence of activity, apart from the building of the actual buildings themselves, are so few and far between um, that when we make our preferences, if, when we make our decisions, when we make our choices about what we think places are, we just have to watch our own minds in action, you know, and think, well, where did that thought come from? It's not from the evidence because there isn't any. So what am I basing that on? You know, what's, is it my expectation or, or, or what? Or, or is it what I'd like it to be? Uh, m more than anything. I think I've witted enough about uh, Orkney on its own as a centre of you know learning or culture or, or uh, and or uh, as a religious centre. And if you're talking about a religious centre, a religious centre for where? It's unlikely to be you know for uh, a vast region at all. And you've got to take into uh, it's a point that Kenny Brophy, I think, made when we were uh, interviewing him, is that because we can see a place, we concentrate on that place as being the place, the one and only place where stuff was going on. And, of course, that's just not the case. There are places that have been covered up and there are places yet to be discovered that may well have been import as important, if not more so, uh, than the places that we jump up and down and talk about um, now. Now, the second part of uh, your, your question, uh, f uh, 48 Walsh, is that you ask, what is the consensus in anthropology and archaeology as to why religion and r ritual changed after the Mesolithic to Neolithic, uh, after the, changed after the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition? And there is no consensus on that because there is no evidence for that. Yes, we know the population uh, changed uh, over time, but what the cultural and religious aspects of that, we just don't know what they were doing. We don't know what the Mesolithic people were, were, were doing. We have artefacts that suggest, you know, they may have been involving themselves in animalistic uh, rituals, etc. You know, the, the headdresses from Star Car, etc., and elsewhere. Uh, and there's somewhere else on the coast up there as well, on the Northumberland coast, I think, where they found similar um, headpieces made made from antlers. So that was going on. But what more can you say than that? Um, there's very little, apart from the burial, uh, uh, the culture of dealing with the dead, 
Um, but that's brought by a different set of people uh, entirely. Um, so it, it wasn't people changing their culture. It wasn't people changing their religion. It was uh, one people being replaced uh, by another. And you know, we know very little about what they were um, actually worshipping or doing or uh, how they were dealing with the spiritual aspects of, of their lives in that time. We can... Uh, it would be lovely to know. And <laughs> we uh, so often ask you know, uh, people that we're interviewing at the moment, if you could go back in time, there's one way, uh, oh, hello, I hear a tick. Did you hear that, folks? That's Rupert wanting to come back in. Uh, guest is in green room. Oh, let me see. Let me get back and see. If oh, there you are. Hello. hello. Long time no see. <laughs> You know, <laughs> isn't it good when a plan comes together? It's unbelievable <laughs> that uh, I don't know if, if Mike's told you while I've been away that my system crashed because of whatever. It was about a month ago, I think, and it's been absolutely rock solid since then until tonight when you're doing a live. It's just yeah. unbelievable. Anyway, never mind. Perfect. Hello. Perfect. I'm sorry. Yeah, here I am again. If it goes off again, what can I tell you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hurrah! Yeah. Some people are glad to see you anyway. <laughs> so I have to ask you, where have you got to? Uh, I was answering uh, 48 Walsh's question about Orkney uh, um, uh, as a ritual or religious centre and the consensus uh, about why religion and rit ritual changed after the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition, that one. And I was saying, well, we all we've got is evidence of uh, a uh, one set of people doing certain sets of things and another set of people doing a different set of things and there wasn't a changeover, mm. there was a displacement. That mm. was a, a precy of uh, kind of what I was saying. Well done. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what can you say? Uh, it, isn't it funny? It, it's, it's an eternally funny thing that people... Uh, insist on uh, on immediately latching onto the religious and and ritual when there isn't any evidence to support that it's just yeah. something that has always been uh, the accepted that's what it is and we, what we've I, said a million times uh, i'm yeah i'm i'm probably just repeating what you've said um but it, uh, you know we, it's something that we've said so many times is what would the attitude be if John Aubrey and William Stukeley had been farmers or mm. had been engineers, uh, you know, it's just that the, the two people who started, you know, what has become archaeology, but these two giants in the world of uh, antiquarianism a few hundred years ago, that they were both devoutly religious men, uh, one of whom in particular was a priest. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, uh, how different would it be if the you know if the people who'd kicked it all off had just had a completely different mindset, um, I, I, you know we we do find it extraordinary. And now it's not to say that they're not centres of religion. We're not saying they're not. We're just saying that there's no evidence to say that they were. Uh, you know. So that's yeah, it really. I also I made that point, and also the point is, what evidence would you look for to support your uh, hypothesis? that they were doing certain, you know, that they were interpreting the cosmos in a certain way and doing certain things. It's not mm. clear what evidence would support any one theory above another one. You have That's to think true. very it's carefully true. about it, what you expect to, to, to find. Um, I, I, I think, you know, the thing that we keep coming up with, uh, do you know what, this is probably not even a question, though, is it? Are we just going off on one? Yeah, we are. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking that you know the, the the places that do support the notion of ritual or what have you are the places where uh, you know we've talked about it before. You know, in the yeah, Middle yeah. East, there's places that uh, there is clearly they've burnt incense, yeah. uh, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and but, incense, incense, and more, and, and indeed a lot more. Yes. Yeah. So let's not go there. Right? No, it's not. Okay. <laughs> Hey ho! 
I'm yeah. just keeping my fingers crossed that I'm not going to disappear again, folks. And I just, I can only apologize. Yeah, me too. My, my, my... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my, my wife's not having a good evening, I can tell you. <laughs> and it's our 43rd wedding anniversary tomorrow. So, yay! <laughs> yes. That is something. That is something. However, I'm going to... Yeah. yeah, My uh, my son said you get less for murder. (laughs) Can... (laughs) Shall I move on? I think I shall move on to the next question, which is from Ken. Can... If... Can... If... Can... I don't know. Um, Ken. I'll just call (laughs) you Ken. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, And Ken... Well, here's the the thing, Rupert. I would... uh, um, K. Locks asked uh, about uh, Birkmoor, uh if we've ever visited it, and I think yeah. you probably have a say, few words to say uh, on top of what I said about it. You know, and the thing, and, and Ken's uh, question is about. Uh, he says, "Love your passion. Keep up the great work. Thank you. We'll do our best." Yeah. Uh, like my fellow countrymen near Cookstown, I'm in Belfast, and love to know which stone monuments would be your top choices to see in Northern Ireland if you were stuck here. Please, nobody freak out the people of great here. Of course, we won't freak out. Of course, the people are great freak out. We have, we have, we have dear friends uh, on the island of Ireland, um, mm. and there are so many. Good grief, there are so many. Yeah, Baymore is. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we need an Irish person to tell us the correct pronunciation of Baymore. I say Baymore. Already been there, usually. done that. Oh, okay. What is Already it? Already set out, sent out the appeal. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. I thought you meant you were going to correct me, but uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I, uh, I, I think you've probably said enough about Baymore. Then that you know, it's uh, it's well, only, I don't know. I, I'll tell you what I said. Mm. Yeah, that one. Yes, I, I, yeah. I did that. Uh, uh, do you know there is another site, and I am um, ashamed to say that I don't remember its name. I th- think it's in Armagh, um, but there is another site that is, it, it in many ways, is similar to uh, Baymore, and it's got ten circles in Ooh. it. Um, but uh, they're quite small. It also me. has a, it has a stone row. Um, I can't remember what it's called. Um, but oh, good heavens above! There are so many. There are so many, and um, um, and this is where I, I, I want to be. There's a part of me that doesn't, you know, doesn't want to pay lip service to geographical boundaries. But then I know that I really run the risk of upsetting people. Um, the thing is that a lot of the prehistoric sites that we're talking about. Uh, you know, they existed when county and country boundaries did not exist. So when you say sites that we'd like to visit in Northern Ireland, uh, I'm presuming that you mean actually in Northern Ireland as opposed to, well, the north of the island of Ireland, um, you know, because there's there is just there's so much. And uh, I'm thinking because you've got uh, you've got Fermanagh, Tyrone, Armagh, Antrim. I'm trying to draw a map of Ireland. In forgive my head. him. Forgive him. Um, <laughs> um, now I'm missing one out. I'm missing one out. I think there's the, are there sorry, five counties in Northern Ireland. Can't help you. Um, and there are loads of sites to see in uh, in in all of them. And there's one of them in particular. It's probably Almar. That's uh, that's got court cans uh, as well. That uh, that really need to be visited yeah what um, you mean like creevy keel? You know, yes i do yeah. mean like creevy keel the trouble is and and this is <laughs> this is where i say with a degree ulster, of embarrassment ca- down ca- ulster Derry. yeah Derry. thank you Derry. Yeah. yeah um but that there are uh, there are a number of uh, sites that are they're not grandiose, you know. Like uh, so, you can go to places like Creevy Keel where it's all very very tidy. You know, you can see exactly um, how it was laid out, uh, even if you can't see the original structure. Now there are similar structures in Armagh and Antrim where uh, they're just not remotely uh, that well preserved or restored. 
uh, but they still really warrant visiting. And a lot of them have names that I can't pronounce, which means I don't hold them in my head. And I can only apologise. But what, yeah. what we will do when we come to Ireland is yeah. we will be dragging Anthony Murphy yes. out of his front door. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he will be taking us and showing us all sorts of places. And what's more, he will be telling us how to pronounce them, yeah. uh, which would help no ends. Uh, yeah. Um, but it, it's true. I mean, all joking aside, the, the, the Ireland as a whole, is so rich in megalithic sites, breathtakingly rich. Um, I mean, you know, if, if those of you that have seen the sequence in Standing With Stones, where I'm poring over a map saying Standing Stone, Standing Stone, Megalithic Tomb, Megalithic Tomb, and, you know, that, that, that was no lie. I was reading it off the map. There are thousands of them, just thousands. Um, mm, mm. It's extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, I hope that's um, uh, uh, sort of dealt with, uh, answered the the question, or given you some uh, idea of. I tell you, I tell you a place that I that I really What's want that? to visit. If the question is where do you really want to visit in Northern Ireland, there is a Cranog on a lock, uh, oh. a lock that is right up near. Oh heavens above. It's it's right at the very very northern tip of uh, of Northern Ireland, and uh, it's called something Head, Ferry Head, yes. or something like that. Yeah, and there is yeah. a Cranog. Uh, there's a Cranog in that lock. I would love to go there because the, it's uh, it looks like it, it's probably a later build. I'd I guess that it's Iron Age um, because it's got dry stone walling where. Some of the older ones would have had timber. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, that that's going to be my uh, my main answer. I think that's where I want to go in Northern Ireland. Uh, uh, just a, a mention, uh, Andrew Andrew Brooks says uh, it was uh, sad to hear about the Cranagon Loch Tay this week. You betcha. Absolutely yeah. uh, gutted about that. Yeah, uh, um, the, the I, 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 you know, we we <laughs> we were scheduled to be going there in September. Yeah. Um. Uh. So you know, very sad that we probably won't be able to do that. But what we will do is but we're far more sad for the as, people that actually work there and uh, all oh, the rest I mean, it's of just, it. Yeah. It's yeah. every kind of heartbreaking. What yeah. we will do as as soon as they've announced anything. Um, and we were talking briefly with Alison Sheridan, or I say talking, we were emailing briefly with Alison yeah. Sheridan about this, uh, that uh, as, as soon as uh, they've actually said, you know, there's going to be fundraising going on and what have you, because obviously they're going to rebuild. Um, just one but moment, as soon as they... Just yes. a sec. Uh, not everybody knows what's uh, happened, judging by the uh, the, the chat oh, here. Oh, oh, Lord. Yeah, the Scottish Cranagh Centre on uh, uh, Loch Tay... Um, which is the only reconstruction I think there is, and it's a full reconstruction, or was a full reconstruction, mm. of an Iron Age uh, Cranach, mm. uh, which is a dwelling um, uh, over the water on, on a lock, or it can be an artificially, and or it can be an artificially built up island uh, for whatever purpose, but in this case it was a reproduction of a, a habitable um, mm. uh, sort of large hut built on stilts out o over the water, and that's that's uh, should keep in your mind's eye as far as this Cranagh uh, was mm. concerned. And it was a, a full blown visitor centre, um, mm. you know, which was actually doing very very well, particularly in the summer months, of obviously, and mm. they had displays and uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, Reenactors dressing up and and uh, cooking going in Iron Age cooking going on. Yeah. We it's a really important e educational resource. You know? Yeah, it's yeah, very important. And it burned uh, down uh, for a couple of days ago. Yeah, it literally it completely why, destroyed by fire. Uh, yeah. yeah, no one knows. Well, they don't know yet what started it, but um, mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, <laughs> it's completely destroyed. But they obviously they will be rebuilding it as soon as they announce uh, what the fundraising etc will be. Then we will do a news piece on that just to point people in the right direction uh, because it is it, it's very important that um, that that gets. 
rebuilt as soon as possible. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, fortunately, nobody was hurt. You know, it, it happened at night, and uh, um, uh, you know, it's one of those tiny, tiny, rare instances where you can say thank God for COVID. Because uh, if it hadn't been for COVID, there probably would have been people there just working on stuff later in the evening. And, you know, mm, so mm. there you go. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, let us move on. And a question from uh, Ian Tarry. Oh, that writing is ultra small. I'm so <laughs> sorry. You know, uh-huh. I can't read it. I don't know if anybody else read it. I can I read it? I can read it. I can. Read oh, you it. can read this it. Is, can you go yeah, for it? I can it. read it. Ian <clears throat> says, "Do you know anything about the Morocco stone circle called the Mzora stones, and anything about the idea that they show a connection to the culture who built Stonehenge? Do you think this is likely? And if so, what does that say about sea travel at that time?" Also, isn't it sad that there's so much Stone Age history in much of Africa that basically, I think he means that, that is basically ignored due to the disinterest of the governments ruling certain countries, possibly due to their religious beliefs and the conflict that such old structures have with it. Um, okay, which a one question, should we take first? A question of two halves. Well, we, yeah. I think Mazura. Let's talk about Mazura and and say what it is, what we know. Okay, about well, Mazura is a, is an enormous uh, stone circle, actually. Um, <clears throat> the the thing is that. <laughs> well, say, say more dated. about because not everybody will know anything at all about it. So okay, we well, to, it's a big stone yeah. circle. It doesn't look anything like Stonehenge at all. Um, yeah. It's it's a big circle of stones. Uh, one of them in particular, he said, trying to visualise, one of them in particular is a very tall stone, but most yeah. of them are not particularly tall. Yeah. Um, uh, don't uh, don't really know um, anything else about it. I'm not I sure. I think there's about 167 much. stones in the circle, but it's not a stone well circle. Well done. My, well done. It, my, my, because the main thing about it is the mound, not uh, some, not so much mm, the circle. It's not, a, mm-hmm. it's not a, a stone, you know, not your common or garden stone circle with a flat no. plateau in the middle. It's got this no. huge mound. So my take on it is that those the stone circle is the curb stone. It's curb stone. Huge... Exactly that. Exactly yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's yeah. not really I, imagine a stone circle. Imagine Newgrange. It's, yeah. It, it, yeah, yeah, that's a good point, actually. That, mm. That's a fair point. Um, but greatly diminished. The, yes. Mm. But the, one of the problems with Mazura is that it's said to be Iron Age, but we actually don't know who dated that yeah. and why they oh, say that. Oh, we're talking that. Morocco. Yeah. Nobody's mentioned Morocco. It's not far from Tanzia. Mm. Well, you know, where do you want to go, though? Uh, yeah, you know, because it's it's one of those uh, the dating. See, we question the dating. It's they say that it's Iron Age, but we're not convinced by that necessarily. So it, the, it, the dating uh, comes from amphorae that were found at the site. But well, exactly, they could be for many it, times. It, but, but exactly, it means <laughs> yeah. nothing. You know, it's yeah. like good grief. People go to Stonehenge and leave their sandwich boxes. Um, yeah. What are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, but but whether it shows a relationship culturally, then you know I don't see that at all. Other than I do that with Stonehenge. No, uh, no, absolutely not with Stonehenge. No, well, that, that was enough. the question. Yeah. Though. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I do um, see a path where you could create a story because it's not alone. The the, the other stone circles. There's loads the, over yeah. there. But, um, uh, but this is the whole thing. <laughs> in the answer to the you know the movement of agriculture and that through the Mediterranean and up the Atlantic seaboard, mm. well, mm. why wouldn't Morocco have uh, megalithic monuments if that yeah. was what was go- going on up the eastern seaboard and up in into into Brittany? So that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That the link isn't yeah. with Stonehenge, yeah. no, I, but, I but, it's that. Tr- but it just, is with the inception yeah. of the whole of the megalithic culture of Neolithic uh, Western Northwestern Europe. Yes, yeah. I mean, it, it's uh, the, and that is speculation. I don't know. <laughs> I, but that's the story <laughs> the, I would like it to be. 
<laughs> but there is another aspect here that we've talked about before in other contexts, and that is the difference between a, a stone circle and a circle of stones. Yeah. And, uh, and so if you look at Stonehenge, because this is kind of tacit within the question, that if you look at Stonehenge, Stonehenge is a stone circle, whereas Mzura is a circle of stones. Um, uh, so, you know, they're, they're profoundly different things. And uh, in, uh, you know, Michael said uh, Newgrange is an example, you know, where you've got this this enormous circle of curb stones and then there is no longer a mound in, in the middle. You know, if you took the Newgrange mound away and all you had left was the curb stone, uh, then it, it's it's much more that sort of beast. Mm, mm. Uh, you know, I think that's a, uh, a Louis, uh, uh Louis says North African megaliths is copper and bronze age, not... Uh, Iron Age. I think the, the careful got to be careful about what you separate two things out. That there are megalithic mm. cultures are much more recent uh, in uh, Africa and North Africa, but are they. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I'll stop talking actually because I'm probably talking about stuff I I know not of, and Louis probably has more knowledge I, than I, I have. And well, it'll be interesting to know from Louis. In fact, Louis, yeah. do feel, you know, please do, you know, if it's something that you've got a chunk of information in your head, do message us outside of uh, of this, you know, that because there, there are an awful lot of things, um, you know, not, not again, if, if we get rid of modern geographical labels, you know, so, you know, we, we talk about modern country boundaries, and uh, you know, and let's face it, Africa as a continent, good grief, is it rich in uh, in prehistory? Yes. Um, but um, but the thing is that so much of the dating that has been done on prehistoric sites has been way less than rigorous, and uh, and so you know we're constantly when we do look at places like uh, um, not so much Missouri, but some of the the kites. Uh, uh, elsewhere in North Africa, uh, uh, the desert kites, for example, that, you know, the, the dating, um, you need to be so careful with the dating, you know, that we might be looking at things that are 5,000, 6,000 years old, uh, some of them even more, but the dating has been based on, you know, as Mike said with Missouri, that, you know, if, if, if it's named after amphorae that were dug up, uh, you know, at a at a later date. Well, obviously, it's going to give you an Iron Age date that doesn't relate to the building. Uh, so, you know, if uh, if Louis, if you're saying that, uh, you know, it, you know, if there's uh, more recent evidence that shows that uh, that these uh, things are uh, bronze or copper age, uh, then you know, it'd be it'll be interesting to know that because the spread, the you know, the dissemination of the uh, the megalithic building the circle building culture you know spreading upwards through uh, uh, you know from Africa in, and on into Iberia and northern Europe uh, you know it's, it, these are all dots that are being put together much more recently really because of the way technology has changed within archaeology you know our, our world is changing so much because of what technology can tell us now um, mm. I, I do think uh, it, it's important as well just to touch on the second half of that question. Yes, very much. In so. that, uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, and I, uh, I, I don't I need want to, to, to re reiterate it though, in case yeah, people have forgotten. Yes. Uh, it, uh, also, isn't it sad that there's so much Stone Age history in much of Africa that basically is ignored due to the d disinterest of the governments ruling certain countries? Possibly due to their religious beliefs and the conflict that such old structures have have with it. That was uh, mm. Ian's take um, on that. Yeah, it's. I mean, obviously, it's different country to country, but uh, but a lot of it is not to do with. Uh, it's not even to do with disinterest. It's just mm. that there is so much uh, trouble within a lot of those countries that actually it is just so low down on their list of priorities you know yeah. uh, we forget quite how privileged we are you know i mean look at the two of us sitting here you know that our work is talking to you about prehistory you know i mean <laughs> 
you know, there there are people who are, uh, you know, just scraping by on a barely, you know, sustaining their daily existence. That the notion of actually spending a lot of money, and it is expensive, to yeah. send teams of archaeologists out to excavate somewhere. You know, it's why if you actually go into any of the, you know, just pick a university, you know, you go to University of, no, I probably shouldn't say Sheffield because they're just closing their archaeology department. But uh, <laughs> but if you, <laughs> but if you take to any, any number, I'm sorry. This is where my head went. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. But if you take any number of universities and you look at the research that is being done, and where funding has been sourced for X, Y, and Z, that the reality is that when you go to countries where there's a lot of difficulty, let's just let's just call it difficulty, that it's never uh, it, it's never local people, it's never incumbent people no, no, who we, are we, doing so the work. Crazy, uh, lucky you know, to yeah. have the time. To mm. you know, spend looking uh, at this stuff. Mm. Uh, anecdotally speaking, you know, uh, we have a friend, you know, that has been to Africa and, and visited stone circles in Africa, and uh, the locals are not really concerned about them at all. What do you want to go to no. that for? What do you want to visit that mm. stone circle for? So that basic interest among the population has got to be there before anybody does mm. anything. You can't yeah. uh, you can't do archaeology in a vacuum of disinterest. <laughs> You've mm. got to be uh, f feeding somebody. So uh, that would be yeah. my take. It, it's not it's not government's disinterest or or uh, you know religious mm. uh, thoughts. Maybe some of that. No, it, it, it's funny. You know that a lot of people. You know even you know taking the concept outside of Africa to anywhere you like, there are people who think that governments suppress information about our past and <laughs> they really don't they really don't it's like to what end what what would be achieved by by stopping you from knowing something that happened 10,000 years ago nothing you know uh, it's it's purely and simply that if you're going to spend a million quid on uh, or a million dollars on a series of excavations then there has to be something that you want to be getting from that investment you yeah. you need to have something in place that this is what we're looking for. We think it might answer this question. Now, if you, you they, they don't just spend vast amounts of money on excavations just to see. Well, let's see what we find out here. Uh, you know, because people won't invest money in that. Um, yeah. Sadly, it doesn't be great get you if they did. Yeah. No. Shall we move no. on? I think. Uh, on, yeah, I think we've. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's entirely my fault that we could be here all night, but you know. <laughs> <sighs> Settle down, folks. <laughs> yes. No, we're uh, oh, right. hello, Matt. Uh, Lazzy, Matt, um, hello there. Um, it, opportunity to speculate. I'm afraid we're going to echoes of the previous question or yeah. uh, thought coming your way, actually, uh, Matt, <laughs> with, with, with this one. It's really, really interesting. So, Matt asks opportunity to speculate. East Kennet Longbarrow. As the slightly larger of the two, and as yet unexcavated, what do you imagine is in there, and what do you imagine it could tell us that we don't all already know? And East Kennet Longbow is probably the largest long barrow uh, that there is. It is. It, it is the long. It, it is, is the large. Yeah. Yes, it, it is on private land, never been excavated, and of course, it's not far from uh, West Kennet Longbow, which a lot of you will already know being the second largest and easily visitable and well excavated. I think that's all the context we need. And, of course, in stone throw from Avebury. That's about all we need to know for the moment anyway. But we're talking about speculation about something that has not been excavated. And that's the trouble. Where would the speculation, because there's no, so there's no evidence for anything, where would speculation get us? That's the real I think answer. in some ways it's very... It, it, <laughs> 
<laughs> in some ways, it's flattering that Matt should be remotely interested in the outpourings <laughs> of our adult minds. But yeah. um, <laughs> but that's the thing, you know, that, that we can just sit here and make up stuff, and and you actually <laughs> you learn nothing at all. Mm. Um, you know, what would you expect to find in there? Well, it's never been excavated. You might get some bones. What's that going to tell you? Um, uh, although, you know, I'm saying that obviously I'm being glib and what have you that, uh, you know, we, we, and, yeah, yeah we, you know, we, we'd learn a certain <laughs> amount from bones, but, but would we learn anything, you know, I mean, to, to go off on that, what might we learn that we've never learned from anything else? Oh, heavens. Well, imagine if you found a piece of a flying saucer in there and now you know that aliens do exist, you know, where do you want to go that way? Or, you know, I know I'm being silly, but. But you know what I mean? It's that as soon as we start making things up, yeah, then it, it, it speaks um, to that question that we were just addressing about the fundamental thing of why you do an excavation in in the first place. You can't now. Back in the day, our gentlemen archaeologists of the the nineteenth century had the money for themselves, and they could, you know, and you know, well into the twentieth century, if we include people like uh, Alexander Keeler. Um, digging up Avebury, of course, that they could do so on a speculative basis. But nowadays, unless there's a development going in, I don't think there's a development planned for uh, East uh, Kennet, uh, uh, you, so if there isn't a development going in, then you have to convince people to give you money to do the excavation. And the only way you convince people to give you uh, money to do ex excavation, you have to have a pretty good idea that doing the excavation will answer a burning question. And you've got to be able to present the probability that the excavation, the money spent, will provide the answer to that, uh, that uh, possibility. And I, couldn't, I can't think of a question that needs to be ans answered by East Kennet. No. Do you, do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Of course it will present evidence, but I can't invent the answer that will get me the money to mm. get in there. Do you see what I mean? Mm. It's, uh, it, it's a curious one. Archaeolo doing a dig mm. is not straightforward. It isn't so not straightforward. No. Yeah. I, I think there there is a lot to be said for you know if um, if priorities were very different in society, and uh, you know and you could get a, a so, few billionaires to say all right let's invest uh, some money just for the hell of it let's just invest some money, and you could get archaeology students to work on sites for the sake of their experience so that they leave university uh you know that much further down the line of uh, you know of okay. being you know solid archaeologists uh then i think that would be a good thing that we could do um but you know as mike said mm -hmm. what, what you know what are you going to learn that um you know <laughs> it's one of the reasons i think the biggest um well, for me anyway, one of the biggest sadnesses in archaeology is you look at somewhere like Maves Ken in uh, in County Sligo, that, uh, that it is quite possible that under that can is the most lavish burial that uh, that Northern Europe uh, you know has ever seen, yeah. and yet what you know where would you start and and all of that you know it's just mm. that there needs mm. to be more than that possibility to justify spending the vast amounts of money it would take matty says excavations are good for confirming similarities between sites yes they are uh, but it's not a it's not a specific enough question to be asking to motivate uh, excavation it's got a, the uh, uh, the questions answered have to be really quite specific and, and there's also there's also no question really about the similarity between um, between the long barrows, uh, you know, as a structural sure. form. Mm -hmm. uh, so so yeah, you're right. But you know, as Mike said, that's you're more likely you, to you're more likely to get funding if you could say we really think this long barrow is different. Yeah, that's true. And we expect that that, that then mm. you're more likely to. Uh, um, you mm. know, if you expect to find something new, not the same, that's when you'll get mm. the funding. But if you've got to make the case, and the yeah. case has got to be based on 
stuff you already, you know and nobody knows anything <laughs> about mm. <laughs> do you uh, um do do you have uh, I'm, I'm talking to you Michael oh me um, thought... do you I... have uh, actually in your head uh, any memory of what they actually um excavated from west kennet uh, oh my lord uh, a lot because i i because yeah i i can't give you specifics no, neither could I. I can't give any specifics either. No, but they, no. they did learn um, a lot from uh, West Kennet. Yeah, so yeah. I, uh, I was just, just thinking. You know. I just want to see what uh, Matt says. Uh, uh, mm. Thanks, though, guys. I would like to think of a perfectly preserved stone bowl or something enigmatic. Yes, yeah. <laughs> if you knew that the stone bowl was there to be discovered, then you could get in there. But we don't know nothing, so yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's I tell you what, what. What I would love, I tell you what I would love. You, you know that that what happened in Ireland year before last and was really only published last year, where they found this almost Egyptian dynastic thing going on that there was this incestuous relationship, probably brother and sister, parents, and uh, and so it it was genuinely this dynastic, probably ruling class. And then they found that in Poolnabrone, which is further over in County Clare, they found that uh, uh, number one, the earliest now, the earliest known case of Down syndrome, uh, a, a, an infant burial, hmm. and that there was in that tomb because it was about thirty odd people buried in there, but but there were people or person in that tomb that were related to the. Uh, the bones taken out of Newgrange. Now, uh, that the fact that we can do that with uh, ADNA analysis now is phenomenal. But I, for me, you know, if I'm going to give you a, a fanciful answer to your question, it would be that if they could show that uh, that East Kennet and West Kennet were these massive high status burials and you could show that the people buried yeah. in east were related to the point. people in west that's exactly west. right that would be exciting yeah. um but again you know there's no evidence to support that from what we know about other long barrows in the area and there were a lot uh, you know the fact is they've all been ploughed out, but there were a lot of long barrows yeah, in the area yeah. back in the but, day. So, mm, isn't know. that a great example, though, of of a, a study with a very specific purpose that gets the, mm. the funding? Not that they had to go and do any digging, mind you. The, you know, the, the bones are already extant from mm. uh, Newgrange and and Paul and Brown that they could deal with but but they were asking a very specific question and it was to look at the dna and establish hierarchies in the neolithic i mean that's the basic of it mm. i think the 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 mm. the, uh, the purpose of the, of the study was that and it reveals these wonderful headlines about incest yes. at newgrange in the neolithic you know yeah. they didn't go looking for that yeah. that's just that's a a, a, a byproduct uh, of a of a very dry academic question, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's funny though. You know, um, uh, who, somebody made a comment. Oh, where are you, Diana? Uh, Diana Patterson said, "Isn't it a failure in PR that billionaires prefer space to archaeology?" And and do you know what? There's a part <laughs> of me that I, I, I really empathise with that. Yes. Uh, and I, I I think that it, the trouble is that it just. Um, it says so much about where we are as a species, really, that, uh, that you know, <laughs> I suppose, you know, space is something that we are going to need for the future, particularly when it comes to, you know, whatever people think about Elon Musk uh, going off on one, trying to colonize Mars, uh, you know, that if we keep doing what we're doing on Earth, we're going to need to have, uh, you know, reseeded Mars. We're going to need somewhere to go. So I think, <laughs> I think it might be important. But uh, yeah, uh, you know that that's a subject for a, a whole long conversation. I, you know, we have in fact when the interview, the the recent interview that we just did with Tim Darvel, when uh, when we get that out, uh, mm. it's it's that thing of the sacred cow of archaeology, you know, and again how privileged we are that we can actually mm. have that attitude. Mm. Um, you know that we should say that uh, you know that this stuff in the ground is more important than farming the land uh, to feed people. You know, mm. 
it, it's it's an interesting dilemma. Mm. Mm. Um, Thanks for posing that. You provided a really great uh, basis for a, a talking point there, and I hope you don't mind that uh, we got a bit. Um... <laughs> <laughs> awful one. I hope you don't feel we were being dismissive either. Anything like that. Okay, shall we carry on? Yeah, go on. Monsieur Soskin. <laughs> um, Pat is up next. Hi there. Hello, Pat. Pat. Thank you. And Pat oh. says, Oh, guys, I've been trying to find information on. Uh, petrosomatoglyphs on stone structures of the Neolithic and Bronze Age. These often seem to be carvings of feet. Why do you think that might be? Also, are there any other body parts commonly carved, and where should I look for more information? The trouble <laughs> is with uh, petrosomatoglyphs. Uh, actually, it's a it's a vast <coughs> umbrella word for quite mm -hmm. a lot of things, not just carvings of. Uh, um, mm. a, a, a feet. Any old uh, any old body part will do, as far as a petrosomatoglyph is concerned, isn't it? Well, technically speaking, if you put your footprint in concrete, it's a petrosomatoglyph. Um, but yes. uh, but I think, in fairness to Pat, um, Pat's talking about actual carvings like the feet. That, in fact, the feet that you so eloquently illustrated uh, on your little film of um, Boscarnan. That's the one. Yes. That's the one. Um, and isn't it fair to say, actually, using that as an example, uh, isn't it right that there are breasts, uh, what could be breasts further up that stone? The, or is that just uh, excuse them me. going off on there? <laughs> Sorry, what? I went like that. I went <laughs> like that. There are two you little did. bumps. I did. There are two yes. little bumps just above. <laughs> Size isn't everything. Up the, yes, uh, up the stone. Uh, so... <laughs> they are schematic, shall we say? <laughs> yeah. If they are representations mm. of breast on that very same stone, and if whether were, whether or not mm. they were carved at the at the very same time, we're not really addressing Pat's question. Um, hey, you've taken it down, so. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. You want me to? Uh, you want to be right. able to see it again? Um, it's in it's, the. Um, um, there you go. Mm -hmm. These often seem to be carvings of feet. Yes, they do, don't they? That's quite strange. Well, um, uh, often uh, we've got more than a couple of examples of that, but they're taken together. They're not very many at all. Um, when I was mm. doing the thing about Boscan Un, uh, all I could find were the Boscan Un feet, which, if you don't know, was only revealed by, I've forgotten his name, the archaeologist photographer does photogrammetry, uh, tip of my tongue, I'm not going to bore you watching me uh, remember his name. Uh, no. Uh, Hugo. Is it Hugo? No, no. Oh, no, it's not. No, 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 no. Not him. Not him. Not, not Hugo we uh, Weimark. No. Uh, Anderson Weimark. Uh, yes. What were thought to be carvings of axe heads, two axe heads at the base of the stone, oh, were yes, found to yes. be uh, feet because in the uh, photogrammetry, the photogrammetry revealed individual toes at the, at the top and the crease in the, in the toe. So when I was looking about for that, the only other examples I could find were the uh, stones at uh, in, um, uh, Liverpool, um, momentarily forgotten the name of those. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Senior moments. Senior, senior moments. moments. Um, and there, is a, there are a few, or they could be comets, we don't know, but they're four, four, four-toed, feet-like structures on the Cochno Stone. Oh uh, yes, that's up a good near point. Glasgow, and also the comparison that I made were with uh, feet carvings, double key feet carvings uh, in a tomb, one of the, to one of the big big tombs actually, uh, in Brittany, and that's all I can think of. Hmm. Um, and, and perhaps Pat has been researching in Lowe's lots more than we do. Well, that's I quite likely know. because it's not yeah. something we've researched, to be brutally honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to lie to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, 
It's, so asking us where we might look, where you might look for mm. information about that, are you, I'm afraid your guess mm. is as good as ours. I uh, will tell you something that concerned. that's so it's important and not both at the same time uh, with these kinds of problems or uh, yeah. examples is that there's no way of knowing. Uh, when the carvings of you know feet or whatever, there's no way of knowing when they were done in relation to the erection of the stone. Um, you know that uh, okay. I know that technically there are you know that there is um, uh, optical stimulated luminescence, and you know there are techniques like that that might give you a clue. Uh, but uh, but the reality is it's a long shot. And so it could be, you know, it, it could be a thousand years after the stone was put up, and uh, and it, it might have been, it might have been something profound. It might not have been. You know, we we don't know. It's one. It, it's more of the unanswerable questions. Um, you know, art. It's a curious thing with art when you you look at uh, how. Yeah, there are thirty thousand year old carvings, uh, particularly some found in France, that are breathtaking. They could have been done by a sculptor today. That understanding of anatomy and the skill yeah. of, the, of the craftsmanship, breathtaking. But all Equally, the, 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 the bison in clay. Yes. You thinking of that? Yeah, Jeez. isn't it unbelievable? Um, uh, and equally, there are much, much more recent representations, whether it's paintings or what have you. I mean, when there was suddenly, you know, it's sort of uh, uh, the, the 13th century, you know, suddenly this massive shift in mindset of art that suddenly people started seeing things in, yeah. uh, in, in a much more... Uh, what's the word I want to use? It's just an understanding of reality, an understanding of how light works and things like that. Um, that that humanity goes through these kind of chunks of we we can be so crude whilst being so brilliant. And uh, and so looking at these, what I'm trying to say, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. It's but it's the fact that you get these crude feet. You know that that we look at them and we say, "Oh no, okay, we've analysed them, and they definitely are feet." And you think, "Well, okay, how much weathering is there? How how good were they when they were actually carved? Uh, you know, were they crude? Yeah. Were they good? Um, uh, and if so, and if those two bumps slightly further up, or I'm still talking about Buzz coming on here, uh, that if they do signify breasts, so it's supposed to be uh, uh, symbolic of a, of a human form, then." How curious to have put the feet on like that in the first place. Yeah, yeah. It's just the strangest. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I can't put myself in that mindset. Jinix, so. I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name uh, correctly, but Jinix uh, says um, there are feet and accents at uh, Gavrinis. Um, Gavrinis is what you were trying to remember, isn't it? No, no. No. Oh, uh, is this okay? No, 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 no. Yeah. It's uh, one of the one of the big. Um, uh, Gavrinis is off on one of the islands. Um, uh, no, it's one of the uh, on the ones on the big big ones on the mainland. Uh, and if somebody yeah. mentioned it, I'll, um, I'll be able to through uh, yeah. big names of big tombs at me. I'd probably be able to pick the right one. Um, but it's one of those bits where stone from the uh, uh, tomb has been put in, mu in a museum. Actually, in this, so this um, stone is, with the feet is actually now in a museum. It's not in the uh, original; its original place. Yeah, it, it's just um, mm -hmm. yes. So, I mean, but it, we, we, the answer is we don't know. It's fascinating, but the the trouble is, I think there's so few of them to be able to join them together and produce some kind of synthesis about what people were doing, some similarities and dissimilarities patterns etc there's not enough to form the pattern to begin to uh, mm. describe or conjecture make conjecture about what they were about uh, really not with any conclusions i i fear mm. 
I fear, I fear, I fear. I suppose it's a question of watch this space. We will, Pat, we will watch out for what you come back with, what you fi find out on your travels and, uh, and digging, because... Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, be, be I, I thought I'd reached the end of it when I did the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I thought I'd reached the limits when I made the Boscon Boscanun uh, film, but um, mm. I'm sure not. All right, um, I'm, tr I'm trying. I, forgive us, folks, if we're not uh, paying attention to uh, the chat. I know there's a couple of questions have got gone by, and I'm afraid we don't really have time to dive into questions that uh, come up. Yeah, on the night in in the chat, we have to concentrate on um, things that po people have posted earlier. If I can just off the top of my, it's a very quick answer. Somebody posted: Are the sites that show reverence for fossils? Yes, there is one at least. Stony Littleton. There's an ammonite in one of the portal stones. That's the end of that um, answer. But it's, that's you know, I thought I'd, I'd just deal with that. Right, then, there's I don't actually know been, there was a. There, there was a paper uh, published on it uh, only this oh. year, uh, and not on Stony Littleton. I mean, but about yeah. the use of fossils in prehistoric sites. If you um, a, a PM me or something, and I'll find you that link if you're interested. Let's move on to Benjamin's question. Benjamin Lofi, uh, two oh. questions. Oh, you. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we can pick. We will pick the one we prefer. Uh, is there much evidence of uh, epidemics in prehistory? If so, what happened to mm. whom? And do we know? How do we know? <laughs> uh, I tell you what, there's a lot more research, uh, uh, Benjamin. There's a lot more research on this than you'd probably imagine. Um, there is a book written by Mary Ellen Snodgrass, if I remember it correctly. Uh, and it's it's called something like epidemics through history, um, and it goes from prehistory to today. I mean, you know, she includes SARS, things like that. But um, uh, the the thing is, the the oldest known uh, uh, the oldest known case of bubonic plague uh, is uh, is five thousand years old. Uh, uh, that was only found. Uh, within the last couple of years anyway. Um, uh, so we know that bubonics have been around for that length of time. Uh, uh, it depends how far back you want to go. And, and also you're saying epidemics, so there's a certain amount that we can't know. I can tell you that bubonics is a thing and it has cropped up on, uh, on a number of occasions. Um, epidemics. I think we'd be pushing it to say epidemics in other cases. I know there was a case yeah. they found, uh, they excavated a bone that showed uh, yours disease, which is a tropical, uh, neotropical disease. And, th but that, you, th that was nearly half a million years old, that bone, um, something like that. Uh, uh, but that's not an epidemic. So, you know, you're asking about, uh, about wiping people out. There is some conjecture, for example, that uh, bubonics, uh, there is some conjecture that when you have, uh, you know, the, the transitions like Mesolithic to Neolithic transition, that this sudden complete change of the population, uh, there is some conjecture that it could have been something like bubonics that actually um, uh, just crippled a, a population to the extent that not that they were taken over it's just there were so few people left that when the next set of people migrating into uh, Britain you know that there was no uh, no significant population to yeah. uh, genetically to maintain its uh, its place uh, it's yeah, just made um, that point yeah and uh, mm. you're welcome uh, grace i hope uh, Hope that was useful. Grace asked the question about fossils. Oh, okay. Yeah. She said thank mm. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, mm. Is, is yeah, that so all we can yeah, say on I, the subject? I, I, well, I, I can't say anything. In terms of genuine epidemics, can't say anything yeah. more than bubonics. I would recommend, if you want to look it up on it, look it up on it, I beg your pardon. It's, it's been a long day. It's long. Um, 
<laughs> if it, but you know, just if you Google um, epidemics in prehistory, just Google that. Um, you'll get the most of what you'll get will be about bubonics because that's what they've found most about in the last few years. Um, but certainly, Mary Ellen Snodgrass's book might be of interest to you if you if you want to follow that up. Uh, yeah, there you go. I'm going to move on. Do, would you believe this is the last question? Okay. We, we've answered all the questions that were posted in the last month. Wow. When we've, when we've dealt with, I, I can't wow. remember what it is. With me not being here for 40 minutes as well. <laughs> 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 oh. Sorry, that's oh. no reflection on you. I just meant the length of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand. Actually, no, there is a question we missed out, and it was one of, it was... Um, um, Oh, not Lazzy. Uh, not not Matt. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, can't remember. Dale does the cattle theory, and we're talking. Uh, 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 sorry, does the cattle theory include the possibility of human slaves as labour as a labour source? Just capture some people from a nearby competing group and work them moving stones. Sounds horrible, but I suppose the times were pretty horrible. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a that's an interesting one. Thank you for the question, <laughs> Dale. And well, uh, yeah. yeah, the Dale cattle doesn't. theory that Dale is referring to is something that we've been talking about recently in one of the prehistory flashes, and that is the mm. study on the heel bones of aurochs and other cattle in uh, the Balkans, which suggest that uh, uh, cattle been used as beasts of burden as early as 6,000 BC. Have I got that right off the top of my head, Rupert? You have, completely. And our conjecture was, well, nobody's looked here yet what if mm. pretty much that yes um <clears throat> that's it you know that uh d d does it include the possibility of human slaves it's not necessary is it um uh i i think it's important to bear in mind here that the notion of slaves on that level in prehistory mm stems from a profound misunderstanding of uh, of society in Egypt back in the uh, in the bronze age where you know people used to say that the pyramids were built by slaves no they weren't they were built by skilled craftsmen who uh, who were well paid had their own town that was built so that they could be on site working uh, there is documented uh, uh, history of the uh, of the workmen going on strike at one point because they didn't have enough beer and onions. Um, <laughs> you know, so you know we we don't really need to uh, to include the notion of, of slaves. Uh, you know, yeah. it, obviously it's a possibility, but but if you're asking if if our theory. Uh, includes the possibility of slaves, then I'd say it's it's not necessary for no. for our conjecture. No. Um. <laughs> all, all you need, all you need, is uh, a strong idea for people to be mm. on board with, and they'll move. I was going to say, you know, they'll move mount. People will move mountains. They will, as long as their they belief is strong will. enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and as long as they get enough beer, obviously. Yes, yes. <laughs> Which could lead us on into a whole new realm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it, I mean, it's an interesting thing, you know, as soon as you start trying to imagine uh, what, uh, you know, what things must have been like in prehistory, you know, and when you say it sounds horrible, um, but you guess the times might have been horrible. Well, you know, on one level, you're absolutely right. We do know from, you know, all sorts of places where people have, you know, bones have been excavated that, you know, there's a whole load of people who just had their heads staved in uh, with a large blunt object. Um, that Yeah, it, it did happen a lot, but that doesn't mean to say uh, that, that humanity itself was brutal. 
you know mm. that it's you know if you think that it's only what is it it's only like 40 years since they uh, they stopped um the guillotine in france it might not even be that mm. um uh, you know we <laughs> Uh, there's an awful lot of parts of the world where where we haven't changed. Well, as a, as a species, we haven't changed a jot. You know, we're we're just as dysfunctional as we were five thousand, six thousand years ago. No shadow of doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. And by and large, uh, it, it, it's it's a question of what works for people. And mm. if people are miserable, they don't do much. They won't. They won't. You know, so, so either people are working towards better times, or they, you know, have a belief that they're going to make their times better by doing this thing, or they've got enough spare time on their hands and they're having a jolly time doing this thing. So I don't buy into the idea of times being particularly horrible for people. Mm. I think they could probably be more brutal and abrupt but as far as day-to-day -day living people make what they make a, a, of of life mm. um mm. you you can't sustain a population if they're just if it's just a horror story for them yeah it's i so mean true, i know people it? are resilient <laughs> but it, it, culture doesn't thrive or any kind of belief system that has them come together to create works it doesn't just doesn't mm. work if they're miserable mm. Mm -hmm. no that's so true i just say andrew brooks thanks andrew who's just said 1977 was the last time the guillotine was used in france there you go i rest <laughs> my case <laughs> Um, although obviously they'd stopped doing public executions by then, but uh, um, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I, I think you know what has changed. You know, again, we have the luxury. How privileged are we? We're talking about this from the luxury of our developed world. You know, there are still places in the world where if somebody wants to come and take your stuff. They'll just plow in and take your stuff, and you know, uh, you know, there was something that we reported on uh, some months ago that was uh, uh, that was a massacre. Uh, mm. That it was quite clear that these people were all completely they weren't expecting it. There was no resistance. Uh, just basically, some people came in, killed all the people in the settlement, and left. Uh, that's what the archaeology tells you. Now. Um, Obviously, you know, you've got good and bad in extremes that I think in the main, uh, life was probably all right. You know, they didn't have electricity bills and all the things that people worry about today on a, you know, we just give ourselves different things to worry about. <laughs> Ain't that true? <laughs> oh, Lord, look yeah. at us. We're getting philosophical now. <laughs> And, yeah, David. Uh, yeah, the insects will inherit the earth. They, yeah, so they <laughs> should. So they should. You just we, you never get dishonesty in the insect world. Rupert Bastards, Sos yes, but not. In Rupert Soskin, we have been at this for two hours. Well, I've been at this for two hours. Well, you've been at it. For you've two had, hours. A, you've yeah, well had done. a couple of breaks. But <laughs> well done. I, I I owe you a couple of beers. I think. <laughs> uh, fair enough. I'll take you on that. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Okay, I I think we've exhausted ourselves now in um, more than one sense. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's so true. Yeah, it's uh, it, yeah. I mean, there's some nice comments coming in now. Is it Benjamin? Uh, <laughs> it says, says, "I wonder if crime finds a way in democracy." I, I'm not going to read your whole comment now, but yeah, absolutely. That's the problem with democracy: is that you always, you know, you don't want to do the bad thing. You know, I'm sure there's an awful lot of things wouldn't happen today if we still had capital punishment. And everybody says, you don't want capital punishment, do you? And I said, let's not have this conversation. Um, you know, it's <laughs> it's uh, it's a terrible thing. You know, uh, it's democracy. You look at the demise of any civilization, the demise of the Roman Empire. It's as soon as civilization gets to a point where decadence can really hold sway then that's when everything starts going downhill. And look where we are now. We have this lazy luxury of electronics 
and I have one power cut and suddenly all the work that I do on a daily basis I cannot do. It just shows how fragile our existence can be. Um, yes, we know which is a little bit that, disconcerting. Yes. <laughs> Always look on. Yeah, let's not. <laughs> um. <laughs> hey ho. Oh, so I think we've uh, ground ourselves into a corner. We almost went into mm. politics then. That would have been a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, hey, thank hey. you so much yeah. for um, sticking with that. Uh, thank mm. you for sticking with us through the lumpy times. Um, and uh, yeah. to be still I, here at what, my, our time, it is 10 o'clock. It's well past yeah. my bedtime. Don't know about it's you. It's 11 o'clock for me. It's yeah. 11 o'clock for me. Uh, do you know what? I'll tell you something funny, though. That, oh, God, uh, here we go. <laughs> that, no, well, at uh, uh, one point when I was, how long was I off? 20 minutes um, or possibly more. And uh, and my wife said, ring ring, uh, ring EDF and uh, and see if uh, if they can tell you anything because there is a line for power cuts, uh, there is a telephone number for power cuts. So I rang the the power cut line, and it said uh, and and it says you have to put in your postcode. And it said there is no outage in your area. And you go okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> You're so useless. You're every kind of useless. Yeah. Oh, okay. Guys, uh, thank you for all your kind comments as well that I see co coming in. The, you're, mm. you're, you're so kind. Um, much, much uh, uh, appreciate uh, uh, your comments and your company. How we great do. is that? We so, do. till uh, the next time. Oh, <laughs> next time, Thursday night. Thursday night. If you haven't seen, we're doing a watch party. We're doing a watch party on... Uh, our film, or yeah, Dolmens of the Longer Dog, I say Rupert's film, because he writ it. Uh, our film. Um, our film. Uh, it's always us, mate. It's always uh, us. It's always, al always us. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I hope you've, um, if you haven't watched Dolmens of the Longer Dog before, go and take a peep. It'll only take you 16 minutes, and we're going to talk you through it and uh, tell you about, you know, our ideas behind it and some of the stuff that mm. went on behind the scenes uh, while we were filming for those glorious few days down uh, near where Rupert lives. Um, investigating the you know the megalithic monuments down there uh, it's nice yeah enjoyed that we did so hopefully we did. we'll uh, see you on on th yeah. thursday night and um and we uh, and and pray for no power cuts indeed <clears throat> indeed fingers crossed <laughs> with that i think we will say uh good night and uh put you out take of care this. if we can find the uh, button to say night night there you go no, it's okay. So the dog's complaining that I'm taking too long. One moment. <laughs> yes, I'm just about to press the finish button. Good night, folks. Thank you, folks. See you soon.